I'm very, very excited to be sitting with these lovely people who did wonderful talks about cultured meat. And now we're going to head to the Q&A that has been populated by our audience. I think I'll start with our most popular question, which I think is directed towards Kate. Speaking of culture media, what about antibiotics? What are the different needs for yeast versus insect versus mammalian cultures? OK, so um, first of all, for antibiotics, you can go one of two different routes. One route you could go is to keep your facility entirely sterile and just kind of expect that you will uh, not have contamination. Or you can go the other route and add particular antibiotics to your media and then remove those later with a, a different kind of resin so they're not in the mix for the full time period. Um, in terms of the different needs of yeast versus insect cells versus mammalian cultures, um, there are lots of different things that are different. One is uh, different conditions that you need in terms of shaking, aeration, um, those kind of basic mechanical concerns. In terms of the media itself, um, yeast has a pretty simple media. Insect cells often have cod liver oil in their media, or if not, fetal bovine serum. Uh, mammalian cultures almost always have SBS. But I, um, I mean in terms of antibiotics oh, in those antibiotics. different cell oh, cultures. Oh, that's how it's, okay, cool. I can ask, answer that. So yeast oftentimes don't need antibiotics because you can use different types of selection for those particularly. Insect cells, you can go one of two routes, either the total sterile or use something like pen strep. Um, mammalian cultures, it's, it's also usually, usually a, an antibiotic like strep or nothing you can try to go sterile how easy is it to go sterile um, so I guess Marianne is probably also a very good person to answer this question but my short answer would be it's go going to take a little bit more work but I think as things scale it's less of a concern yeah it's um, so you can go antibiotic free in cell culture you need extremely extremely good technique to do it um, in terms of um, something that is going to be regulated, I think it's going to actually have to be part of the research pathway mm. um, and to find techniques um, to, to do that well. So we, we know, um, you know someone who's good at doing cell culture can comfortably not use antibiotics, okay. um, but how we transfer that into the culture uh, bioprocess is, is, a, is a good question. Yes. Cool. Uh, let's move on to our next question for Marie. Um, I'm assuming MUSC means muscle satellite cell. So are these muscle satellite cells immortalized? What is the limit of passaging these cells? And how does constant, what if, I guess it means, what effect does constant passaging have on MG1 cells? Okay, so um, great question. I guess it depends on how you would define immortalization. Um, I was, I've read in multiple uh, reviews that immortalization occurs after 100 cell doublings. However, after that happens, you're going to assume that these cells are, continue to, are going to continue to double forever. And while my cells have gotten to around 150 cell doublings, they eventually do start to peter off at around 50, or, uh, 35 cell passages. Um, so in terms of immortalizing, I think that you can do that, you know, if you have something that kind of naturally immortalized by um, living in these conditions and just had some sort of genetic mutation, maybe it is um, unrestricted telomerase expression. Uh, you can also go in there and add telomerase in by genetically modifying. But uh, what I think is also very possible is that we can uh, make these cells immortal just by their environment. And that's um, something that I'm really excited about with the myospheres, because if telomerase is something that is regulated by differentiation, and if differentiation uh, in turn is regulated by attachment, then having cells grow in a suspended state, uh, they may never get any signals to tell them to stop expressing telomerase. And that's, that's kind of the modification that we find acceptable for food crops already. Absolutely. By rather changing than, the environment. Yep. Instead of, yeah. yeah. Uh, did I answer everything? Uh, one more question was, how does constant passaging change the phenotype of the cell? Um, so, okay, that is a good one. So after a while, around um, passage 14 or 15, we do start getting a little bit of um, mutation. Uh, and specifically for this MG1 line, um, they start to become... Uh, um, 
Anchorage independent, which you would think, oh, that's awesome because that's what we want if we're growing cells in suspension, but at the same time, it's something that I would rather not work with because if they're Anchorage independent, then that means that we're going to have to figure out a way to get them to, um, oh, and when I say Anchorage independent, what I mean is that they don't need to grow on anything in order to um, continue to proliferate. So normally, when the cells are growing, after they reach a certain confluence, they're going to turn into uh, a myotube, but with these guys, after um, certain passages, there are select areas where they have uh, they have mutated and they're no longer developing these myotubes. They're just continuing to grow on top of each other. Um, and so that's something that we don't want to work with because the whole point of this is to be able to get myotube formation eventually. So. Do you think there's a world where we don't want myotube formation and maybe just the cells are tasty on their own? I don't see why not. <laughs> <laughs> um, a question for Marianne. Um, what are your thoughts on small-scale bioreactors as appliances? I have many. Um, I think it's, it's definitely something that we can, um, that should be part of what we're looking to do. I think um, right now, for sure, there's no definitive um, direction whether we should go small-scale or really large-scale. Com you know, basically, we're comparing to, say, bread production or, or, or brewing. There's, all, there's a whole range that we could do. Um, in terms of um, the small scale, I think possibly one model to think about is the Nespresso coffee machine. Yes. Um, and um, it's a great business model um, to, to consider. Um, so there are, you know, it's a bit more challenging than putting coffee in pods and into a machine. Um, but it is something I think that um, we should be considering for sure. And I think it can stimulate a whole different type of industry too, because yeah. you have the suppliers of all those little things that you yeah. have to buy. Yeah. for your machine. Yeah, so you, you have the whole microeconomy around that, yes. um, which is great for anywhere where that happens. And also, um, as soon as people get their hands on bits of kit, we know people like to take them apart. And yes. so we can expect even more innovation. So absolutely, I think um, this is one of the di directions to go. Absolutely. Um, I have a question for Natalie now. Natalie, what are the most abundant proteins in the extracellular matrix from the mass spec data? Um, so we did mass so before. Uh, what is the mass spec on first? So the mass spec we did on the decellularized meat. So we took beef, chicken, and turkey, removed the cells, and then analyzed it using LCMS. And we saw that all of them had a lot of collagen 4 and fibronectin. And because we saw, and there was one more that I forget, but they all had a high percentages of those three. Um, and then talking to Postdocs in my lab, they also noticed that their proteins um, had the similar numbers, so we wanted to double check that our machine is working properly because we didn't expect that. Um, also, Kate has told me it's really easy to get contamination from human skin cells. Um, so we want to redo that and make sure that we're looking specifically at turkey proteins and that it hasn't been contaminated with human. So we're going to redo that, but it is well known that collagen is the major component of extracellular matrix proteins. I had a question now for Kate. Kate, why does media research need to be open source? Well, I think this is a really important um, aspect of media research in that um, when people have a formulation, they're going to iterate and improve and make it um, to their taste and to their cell lines, and then they're going to do things that we wouldn't even expect them to do with these things, and that's exactly what we want. We want open innovation on these things. Um, particularly for media, it's interesting because this field is notoriously proprietary. Mm -hmm. So there are lots of different really interesting medias out there, but we really like don't know what the key components are often because they're trade secrets, um, which is a real frustration if you want to improve and um, make superior products at lower cost. For sure. I'm going to just go a little bit further with that. There's, there's only two types of IP that were born open source sewing patterns and recipes. And recipes, I, I was just, I made chocolate cookie, chocolate chip cookies this week, and it's like the new improved chocolate chip cookie recipe that everyone's supposed to use after the Toll House one. The Toll House one is so famous that when you, I just Googled Toll House, and then the chocolate chip cookie Wikipedia page comes up. And so I was just thinking about when I made those cookies, I could read 30 comments of people who made the cookies themselves. They're like, no, you should chill for 48 hours, not 24, because it makes it better. No, I like the flat chocolate flats instead of the chocolate chips. I think serum should be kind of like that, too, where 
You can have the serum ingredients there, and then all the comments are like, no, you should heat this a little bit longer. This process needs to be a little bit shorter. A little bit of this is great for muscle cells, and a little bit less is great for neurons, so on and so forth. Because I think we'll just, we'll just move towards a better chocolate chip cookie recipe for serum that way. Cool. Um, the next question was, Marie, did you try the nugget you made, and how did it taste? <laughs> yes, and it tastes just like chicken. <laughs> we didn't tell her to taste it. No, they didn't. <laughs> <laughs> but I would have liked to see someone try and stop me. <laughs> Why do you think it tasted like chicken? Um, so that was actually kind of concerning because I wasn't using chicken. I was using turkey. Um, <laughs> uh, the other thing is that I actually haven't had um, traditional chicken or turkey in quite some time. Um, so I may not be the best judge, but I do remember what it tastes like. Uh, so my initial thought was that I, I was using chicken serum, and yeah. so the, the chicken serum was what was giving it the taste. But then I thought about that a little bit more, and I realized that I had rinsed that nugget quite a bit um, before eating it. And also, whenever I you know, cut myself, and you know, if I cut my finger and taste blood, my blood doesn't taste like chicken. It doesn't uh, taste that way. I mean, I guess I wouldn't taste like chicken anyways, but, um, but it did have a very different flavor uh, than what blood would taste like. And uh, after speaking with some more people about it, apparently, um, really anything is gonna taste like chicken unless you have extra fat and blood in it. So I think chicken taste is just our, you know, we're working with a, a default um, cultured meat taste for now is chicken. Do you think it's possible that the FBS is like a really delicious broth? Oh, so I use chicken serum, not FBS. Oh, sorry. Um, and I have okay. not tasted that, so okay. I will have to. Has anyone, does anybody know what FBS tastes like? I think Oron like? will know about that later. He'll talk about that. <laughs> <laughs> um, one more question for Marianne. How far along is the cellular agriculture industry in terms of development, design, and mass production of industrial scaled bioreactors necessary for clean meat scale up? Well, um, so I don't have information on what all the, the current companies are doing. So there's probably quite a lot in there, I'm guessing, if they're already quite close to commercialization. But from a, um, a research perspective, um, based on experience of, um, of our, our previous work expanding organoids, um, it took us 18 months to design a, um, a scalable process for commercialization. Um, and actually, the, the principles can be applied here as well because we, um, we, we, the science is well established, the engineering is well established. Effectively, we are borrowing from, from decades of biotechnology, um, but bringing in the tissue engineering. So, um, you know, from, from scratch right now, I think um, 18 months we could build something that looks pretty much like that. Like the rendering. Yeah. And in addition to that, what else grows in a bioreactor over a three month period? <laughs> At the same time as the cells? Um, I assumed it meant, Hopefully are nothing. there things that exist today that we grow oh, okay. in biorefters for three um, months periods? Uh, so Chinese hamster ovary cells, which um, are used to produce um, medicines, antibiotics, um, and um, uh, so um, other kind of co like medical components, um, they are kept for a very long time, but essentially what they do, they, um, it's semi-batched, so they'll kind of put some in and remove some. So they'll, they'll, be, they'll be grown for months and months on end. Um, yeast can go for, uh, yeast and algae can go for well over three months. Um, th so people have kept various cell lines, not primary cells, but um, immortalized cell lines going for years. Um, so it really depends on your, on your starting um, wow. population. But three months is not actually a, a problem at all. Okay. And then for the last question, I thought we'd ask every panelist, where would you invest an additional $1 million in terms of research? And maybe we'll start with Marie and make our way across. Uh, I, would, I would invest it in algae because we're going to need that for uh, not only what Marianne was talking about in terms of the recyclability of it, but we can use that to, to feed our cells and then in turn the cells can feed the algae. We can use that to make scaffolding. Um, it's something really, really easy uh, to grow in a controlled way. So yes, algae. 100%. So algae specifically to formulate media? Media, scaffolds, uh, waste products. What's like one, you have $1 million, which is like 
maybe three research projects. <laughs> what, what is one thesis you would, one question you would try to address? Um, well, I would, I would address uh, the, the media, being able to use algae to feed liver cells. Cool. Natalie, how would you spend one million dollars in research hmm. money? Bless you, just to mix it up, I'm gonna say fat. We haven't talked about fat much, but um, it adds a lot to the taste, and we need to figure out, can we just use plant-based fat, um, fats we already have, and will that give us the same taste, or do we need animal fat, and do we need to culture that, um, figuring out how to culture that with muscle cells. So that's an area that I haven't seen much research in that I could think could use a lot of attention. Would you wanna see that fat grown in animal fat cells, or you want to see what kind of fats you can bring in from other places? I'd start with seeing if we can use fats that are already available, like plant-based fats, and mm -hmm. see if that works, and then see what's missing. If it, you know, maybe in cell culture it all like coagulates in one corner, and we need something that better disperses through the muscle. So figuring out what problems we have, and then we'll know how to. There's just it. a side question. How is it possible to make muscle cells differentiate into fat? To make muscle cells differentiate into fat. So that'd be like trans differentiation. So it's not, you can't take a, well, you could, so if you have a differentiated muscle cell, um, you could de-differentiate it into an earlier stage cell and then re-differentiate it into a fat cell. So that's something like iPSCs, induced pluripotent stem cells. So that takes a lot of transcription factors um, and figuring out how to do that. Um, but one of my research projects over the summer that Andrew Goldwasser did um, is we looked at using this coenzyme called MitoQ10, which is actually a supplement that people take for their metabolism. Um, and you can give it to specifically Marie's turkey myoblast cells, so not fully differentiated yet. Um, and we saw over time that these cells produced lipids. Um, so they didn't trans-differentiate necessarily into fat cells. We didn't look at specific adipocyte markers, but the cells themselves were producing uh, lipids. Cool. Kate, how would you spend a million dollars in research funding? I'd spend it on um, kind of piggybacking off the fat idea, uh, flavor components. So fats are known for um, transmitting flavors, but I think another key part of the process is how we actually control protein flavor and the flavor that's conveyed by these different products. Because I think that's a really novel area where we could, in theory, get some really interesting tastes. I mean, we understand umami, which is a breakdown of certain proteins, mm -hmm. but I, I think the tunability of that and the, the kind of variable space we have to play with in terms of flavors, we could really exploit to good effect. And that would have huge impacts in the plant-based replacements, yes. too. Cool. And Marianne, last but not least, how would you spend a million dollars? Um, I would spend uh, one million dollars um, for a 12-month project with four people in the same place looking at, um, I've had longer to think about this, um, <laughs> looking at com uh, simultaneously researching media scaffold and reactor to, so then you can within that time actually look at the media recipe and increase yield, but kind of the, the sum of the parts, um, the, or the whole is greater than some of the parts, so have everybody in one place. So I would spend the money on people. Of course. Um, that sounds like you've written that grant application. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, last but not least, before we break for lunch, I'll ask each of the panelists what m cultured meat they would like to eat first. Uh, so I've already. Well, um, <laughs> second. Um, second, I would. I'm really looking forward to some bacon. Um, besides bacon, is there anything <laughs> else? <laughs> um, no, <laughs> just bacon. All I would right. totally go with bacon. All right. Okay. <laughs> I'm going to break from bacon, and uh, I noted, uh, so Natalie had these great visuals where she had this bioprinted collagen that looked like it was producing maybe, say, like textured materials that might taste really interesting, so I'd like to have um, kind of like a woven steak. Cool, something new. Yeah. Exciting. Marianne? Um, and um, I would come back to the kind of the, the, the pig question, but specifically um, Welsh rare breed yes. pigs. Yes, <laughs> of course. Well, let's give our panelists a round of applause.